So, once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow have survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP4365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf is a star that has burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. One of those zombie stars used to be a white dwarf or just left over from an explosion. It gobbled up too much from another star and, surprisingly, managed to explode once again. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. In outer space, you'd be strong enough to weld two pieces of metal together with your own hands. Okay, it has nothing to do with your strength. You could just press them together with no effort, and that's it. Oxygen in our atmosphere makes a thin layer on the surface of the metal. It's like a barrier, which is why such a trick is impossible on Earth, but perfectly logical in outer space. If you ever go to space, Don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. Yeah, small comfort, huh? If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around your eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, there's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen, and since there's not any in space. If the fire breaks out in a rocket, you can simply turn off the ventilation system and voila! It can get more complicated if there's intense smoke, sparking, and material melting in conditions of reduced gravity. Regular foam fire extinguishers we use on Earth are useless here because they release foam randomly. Researchers are developing a fire extinguisher that will put out fires by using sound waves. The bigger the sound intensity, the bigger the flame they can put out. But the astronauts might end up deaf if their frequency is too high. A black hole is not like some starving monster that wanders around and has gravity so strong nothing can really escape it. When something comes close to the point of no return, which we also call the event horizon, it disappears. No way back. But quantum physics claims nothing can really destroy data. So it's a true paradox. Stephen Hawking was the one with the idea of how black holes don't really have event horizons. Maybe they have apparent horizons. Those trap things for some time only. After that, the trapped energy will somehow get away, but in a different form. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. It happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it in another. Like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like 4 billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. There are more than 23,000 pieces of so-called space junk bigger than a softball floating above our planet at speeds up to 17,500 miles per hour. Woo! And there are 500,000 pieces in general, some of them the size of a marble. Space waste is generally debris made up of natural particles called meteoroids and artificial particles, like things we make on the Earth. Meteoroids orbit the Sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world, from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. 
Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. There's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the rest of the 70% of the universe. Scientists don't know much about it, but they think dark energy could be behind the increasing expansion of the entire universe, while dark matter slows it down. Dark matter doesn't interact with us in any way that we know of, nor does it interact with itself. If it did, we might be able to find dark matter galaxies, dark matter planets, or such objects. Now, astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bit bored and wanted to check out how things were going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the cosmic microwave background map, or in short, CMB. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. But instead of CMB, they realized there's a giant area way colder than they'd expected. The team started tracking radio signals, but there were no radio sources in that whole volume. That means there are no galaxies or clusters, and since it's so cold, there's no dark matter either, or regular matter. So it really doesn't matter. The giant void is empty, and researchers think it could consist of dark energy. Light can still pass through it. It's not the only void in space, but it's the biggest one we've found. The area around a star is habitable when it's not too cold or too hot for liquid water to exist on the planet surrounding it. Let's say our planet was where Pluto is. It's too far from the sun, which means our ocean and big parts of its atmosphere would freeze. But if the Earth was in Mercury's place, we'd be too close to the sun, and the water on our planet would evaporate. Such habitable area is called the Goldilocks zone. So you can see where planets are located and assume if they have a chance for life on their surface. But Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, definitely breaks the rule. It's outside of the Goldilocks zone, but still kept warm. Not from the sun directly, but Jupiter and its moons that actually pump energy into Europa. Europa changes its shape as it circles around Jupiter. It's similar to tides rising and falling on our planet. Water on the Earth changes its shape as a response to the tidal forces of our moon. When the same happens with a solid object, the object is stressed. That's how you pump energy into that object. It's like you're playing racquetball. You hit the ball around a couple of times before you start playing like you're warming it up. You kind of distort the ball every time you smack it. The surface of Europa is frozen, but it has cracks in the ice. You can see ridges in the ice where there's a crack. Then those flying chunks shift and refreeze. You'd see a similar thing if you could fly over the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime. There are ice sheets constantly breaking and refreezing. So Europa can't completely freeze. Scientists think there could be an ocean of liquid water under the icy surface. Europa is not the only moon where this is happening. Another of Jupiter's moons, Io, is also warm because of such tidal forces. Io also has volcanoes erupting from within all the time. So it's not only that the Sun warms the space bodies and pumps them with energy. Many experts agree the universe might come to its end about 3 to 22 billion years from now. It's expanding all the time, which means it formed from a compact state. If it has a beginning, it's probably going to have an end as well. Yeah, I won't be around for that. One of the popular theories says the growth will slow down, and gravity will become the powerful force that will make the universe shrink. That will lead to complete chaos. Galaxies, stars, planets, space bodies, they will all move, collide, and, you know, destroy one another. It's like the reverse Big Bang. Huge chaos, but this time, everything collapses. Well, on that cheery note, always stay on the bright side of life. Many people would like to fly into space. Zero gravity, a stunning view of Earth from one side, and the boundlessly frightening black area from the other. Yeah, it's all cool. But don't forget that this journey can turn into a nightmare. 
lack of oxygen, floating in outer space and staying in a spaceship for a long time without understanding when you can return home. This last thing happened to a Russian cosmonaut. His stay in space is one of the longest in the world. 33-year-old flight engineer Sergei Krikalev spent 311 days in zero gravity on the Mir space station. But that's not the most interesting part of this story. Sergei's long journey began on May 18, 1991. That day, he boarded a transport ship and went into space to the Mir space station. On May 20th, the docking with the station was completed. There, together with another engineer, Sergei performed his space duties. They went on spacewalks several times, did repairs, took care of the station, and conducted scientific experiments. When you have company and a lot of work, living in space is not so hard. But things got worse on the day when Sergei was supposed to return home. According to the plan, the mission should have lasted for five months. A new astronaut was supposed to replace the old ones. The transport ship had finally docked with the station. But on October 10th, only one astronaut returned to Earth. Sergei was left alone at the Mir station. He continued to work as the sole flight engineer of the crew. The station couldn't remain empty. They had to send someone to replace Sergei. He wasn't ready for such a long stay in space. He hadn't trained for it. But there was no choice. He couldn't just leave the station. One month passed. They informed Sergei that he would return home soon. But something happened that no one expected. They contacted Sergei and said he couldn't return since the country that promised to bring him home no longer existed. During this time, a big crisis began in Russia. The cosmonauts' return was impossible since no one had the money for it. Just imagine Sergei's condition. You were hundreds of miles from home in black outer space, completely alone, and have no idea how many days you have left to be there. The days passed slowly, weeks, then a month passed, it would have been much easier if being in space was not harmful to your health. But in conditions of zero gravity, the human body takes serious damage. First, it's a weakening of the muscles. The body doesn't receive the necessary load it needs, and the muscles are constantly in a relaxed state, leading to dystrophy. Yes, astronauts do a set of exercises every day, but this is not enough to keep the body in shape. In addition to muscles, bones begin to weaken and a person becomes weak. Even after six months of such a life, any astronaut needs a long time to get back into their previous shape after returning home. Also, there's a lot of radiation in space, which is dangerous for people. It comes from several sources at once. The main radiation comes from the sun. On Earth, we're protected from it, thanks to the planet's magnetic field. Almost all radiation accumulates in the upper atmosphere and doesn't reach us. This accumulation of radiation in the atmosphere is also bad for astronauts. But the worst radiation is the galactic one. It comes from distant stars and galaxies and has a powerful effect on all living things. Radiation provokes many unfavorable conditions and destroys the body at the cellular level. Now, all spaceships and the ISS are equipped with shields and coatings that reflect radiation. But still, it doesn't provide 100% protection. In space, the astronaut's immune system changes. There are no conditions under which immunity could improve. It seems that there's nothing wrong with the absence of many bacteria and microbes, but the body's defense is weakening. A person becomes more vulnerable to microbes that can be brought by another astronaut. You also have serious food restrictions. Food in tubes doesn't contain as many useful vitamins as it does in natural products. Without vitamins, the body weakens even more. And sometimes, astronauts have to go on spacewalks, which aren't easy. A spacesuit is a huge and uncomfortable outfit. It constrains your movements and puts pressure on your body. Work in space can last up to several hours. During this time, you sweat a lot. One of the suit's filters may be broken, and all the fluid released by your body can spread throughout the suit and reach your face. Your eyes may water. The drops could interfere with your vision. Thousands of dangers can await an astronaut during a mission in outer space. Imagine that you do some repairs and something goes wrong. The wrench jumps off the bolt and it flies out, for example. You try to catch it and unconsciously push off from the ship. You catch the bolt, but your body is already flying away. You have nothing to hold on to. But fortunately, you have a safety rope. Anyway, 
it can break off from your spacesuit because you attached it incorrectly. As soon as the rope breaks, your body changes the angle of flight. Now you're not just flying away, your body is spinning at this moment. The Earth and black space flash in your eyes. So you get it. There are definitely risks, but nothing like that happened with Sergei. All astronauts spend many hours training to be ready for any troubles. They gain good physical shape and lose it during the mission. Add to this the psychological factor. Your body weakens, you don't breathe fresh air, you can't see your friends, and you don't have the opportunity to return home. A small layer of wall separates you from the cold vacuum of space. All this causes stress, which also weakens your immunity and harms your nervous system. Fortunately, astronauts also get through serious psychological training. They can maintain self-control in the most stressful situations. But when you're alone in space for more than six months and don't know when you'll return, you can get seriously nervous. Fortunately, Sergei didn't panic. He performed his daily duties, trained, and of course, missed home. A month later, he received the same response. We can't bring you back yet. The country is in a difficult situation. He felt worse every day. His strength was leaving him. He wasn't sure if he'd be able to survive. The most interesting thing is the station had a capsule developed to return to Earth. But Sergei didn't use it because no one would have served the station. Russia sold the station seats to other countries. Also, they hoped to sell Mir. This meant that Sergei had to keep the station working. Sergei's mission lasted twice as long as planned. As a result, he spent 10 months, or 311 days, in space and set a world record. During this time, he flew around the Earth about 5,000 times. Finally, he received the long-awaited message. He's coming home. Germany paid about $24 million for a ticket to the station. They were going to replace the astronaut. Krikalev got into the capsule and flew to Earth. Many people were waiting for his return down there. The cosmonaut landed and everyone rushed to help him. He looked very thin, sweaty, and exhausted. Four men helped him out of the capsule. They helped him stay on the ground, gave him a fur coat, and brought a bowl of broth. It seemed that such a flight would leave an imprint on his life forever. But the cosmonaut's mood was excellent. Two years later, he went into space again and became the first Russian cosmonaut to fly on a NASA shuttle. And two years later, he was one of the first to live on the ISS. In 2005, he made his sixth and last flight. He went to the ISS, where he spent about six months, after which he returned home on the lander. After this flight, he set a world record for the total duration of stay in space at 803 days. Only 10 years later, someone managed to break that record, but that's a different story. They say somewhere out there, there's a pen that can work in zero gravity, at extreme temperatures, and even underwater. They say this pen can write on almost any surface, or if you turn it upside down, or when your surroundings are heated up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. They say NASA spent millions, or probably billions of dollars, and almost a decade to develop such a pen. The problem with ballpoint pens in space is that they don't work in the conditions of weightlessness. The ink can't flow to the ball normally, since gravity doesn't affect it. Instead, pressure is created in the ink reservoir, and pens start leaking. Some time ago, NASA used pencils, but wooden pencils were considered to be a fire hazard in most spaceships. All because, at that time, the atmosphere inside them was 100% oxygen. The need for a super pen was obvious. But whatever the rumors claim, NASA did not create such a pen, spending a fortune on the research. Its development was sponsored by Paul C. Fisher of the Fisher Pen Company based in Chicago. He spent over $1 million and almost 10 years to make a pressurized ink cartridge. It was supposed to allow space pens to function in zero gravity and other extreme conditions. Eventually, they got a pen that could write at a temperature of minus 30 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really impressive, isn't it? The pen was patented in 1966. And one year later, after conducting several thorough tests, NASA started to provide Apollo astronauts with such pens. Interestingly, the rumors about NASA spending an insane amount of money on the development of space pens have been circulating for decades. 
They have been debunked many times, but they appear again and again. Many sci-fi movies can make you believe that everything happening in space is accompanied by some kind of a sound effect, which is a totally false misconception. In space, no one will hear you scream. You know why? There's no air in space. It's an almost perfect vacuum. And sound waves don't travel through a vacuum. They can't reach your eardrums and make them vibrate, sending signals to your brain. But it's a good thing, especially for astronauts on spacewalks. If not for the quietness of space, they would be constantly overwhelmed by the noise of solar storms. Here's another one. All comets have beautiful long tails. It's nothing but a popular misconception. In reality, comets are very difficult space bodies to spot. They usually spend large amounts of time far away from stars. There, in the darkness of space, they remain rather inactive and completely frozen. Comets only get tails once they come close to a star. That's when they start warming up. This process makes them form some kind of a cloudy atmosphere, which is called a coma, and a distinctive tail. The tail always points away from the star that influences the comet. It happens because the tail gets blown in the opposite direction by solar radiation and solar winds. That's why the tail can often be in front of the comet, not trailing after it. Now, let's look at a light year. This very notion makes us believe we speak about time here. But in reality, light years measure distance. NASA's definition of a light year goes like this. The total distance that a beam of light moving in a straight line travels in a year. And since light moves at a speed of 186,000 miles per second, a light year equals almost 6 trillion miles. Hey, do the math! Now, people often believe that in space, you experience zero gravity. Hence the weightlessness astronauts feel on the International Space Station. But that's not exactly true. Gravity is one of the most important forces that exist in the universe. Thanks to it, the Moon can orbit Earth, and the Sun doesn't float away from our home Milky Way galaxy. But the astronauts on the ISS experience not full-fledged, but microgravity, which means very small gravity. The gravity on the space station is only 10% weaker than the gravity on Earth's surface. But astronauts are constantly in freefall. The spacecraft, the people inside, and all the objects aboard keep falling forward, not down, but around our planet, following a specific orbit. And since they're all falling together, the crew and the stuff inside seem to be floating. That's why astronauts can move things as heavy as hundreds of pounds with their fingertips. And even though microgravity is often called zero gravity, they're very different things. Now, it may seem as if the sun is always on fire. At least, that's what it looks like in pictures. But in reality, our star is a giant ball of gas. Hey, I can relate. Nuclear reactions happening in its core at all times makes the sun burn. Every second, hundreds of millions of tons of hydrogen are converted into almost as much helium. During this process, huge amounts of energy are released as gamma rays. Then, these rays turn into light. In other words, the sun does emit blinding light and incredible heat. But it's not actually on fire, because no oxygen is involved in the process. A human can explode if they get into open space without a spacesuit. Well, contrary to popular belief, taking off a spacesuit during a spacewalk won't be as dramatic as it's often pictured in movies. A person will lose consciousness due to a lack of oxygen after 15 seconds of being in outer space without protection. Before it happens, the person should breathe out as much air as possible. Otherwise, this oxygen will damage their lungs from the inside. Then, without the protection of the spacesuit, which is like a mini spaceship, the pressure inside their body will drop. This will cause even more serious troubles. And even though this person definitely won't burst, they won't want to stay outside for too long. Black holes are giant, scary, cosmic vacuum cleaners, they say. But in reality, black holes are more like fly traps. They don't look for things to munch on. Instead, they sit out there quite passively. Only when a star comes too close does a black hole spring into action. Even so, only those space objects that cross a certain border get ripped apart. If the Sun were suddenly replaced with a black hole, Earth's orbit wouldn't change. At the same time, Earth's temperature would be different. There would be no solar wind, and no magnetic storms created by the sun would affect our planet. 
And let's say the black hole that replaced the Sun had the same mass as our star. Then, according to the law of physics, Earth would have to come very close to get pulled into this black hole. Now, the dark side of the Moon myth was debunked more than 50 years ago. And still, not everyone knows that this dark side is simply part of the Earth's natural satellite that faces away from our planet. By no means is it darker than any other region of the Moon, and sunlight falls equally on all sides of the satellite. It only seems dark because we never see this side of the Moon from Earth, all because of the phenomenon known as tidal locking. Over billions of years, ooh, let me say that again, billions of years, the gravitational connection between our planet and its natural satellite has changed their orbits. The speed at which they move has also become different. And since Earth is way bigger than the Moon, the satellite's rotation was gradually slowing down. Until at one point, it reached the point of balance. And now, it takes the Moon the same time to make a full rotation around its axis and to fully orbit around Earth. Now, you might have heard people referring to Venus as Earth's twin. It's true that both these planets are of almost the same size. They have similar mass and composition. The surface gravity on Venus is 91% of that on Earth. So, if your weight was 100 pounds on our planet, on Venus, you'd weigh 91 pounds. And still, calling these planets twins is a step too far. The atmosphere on Venus is 100 times thicker than that on Earth. Plus, its surface temperatures are insanely high, up to 850 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to melt lead or burn up your pizza. Venus has no water oceans or any life forms. It also rotates backward compared to all other planets of the solar system, including Earth. By the way, another myth claims that Mercury is the hottest planet in the solar system. After all, it's the closest planet to the Sun, but Venus is actually hotter. Asteroids strike Earth much more often than people tend to believe. But most of these collisions aren't history-changing extinction events. Most of them go completely unnoticed. Most asteroids that approach our planet are qualified as small, near-Earth objects. They usually burn up in Earth's atmosphere before they even have a chance to wipe out life off the surface of the planet. Not that they're big enough to do that. And still, around 40 to 80 tons of space debris fall on Earth every year. Most of this debris is tiny asteroids, also called bolides. They're usually no larger than 65 feet in diameter. Um, that's small? Yeah, says so right here. Okay. You may think the Earth is pretty big, but the Sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system. The rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites, asteroids, comets, gas, and dust. It's around 93 million miles away from our planet, but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this, we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside some object. Temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object, it makes its temperature go up. When the object is losing heat, the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation. That means it's releasing heat in the form of light. Your body radiates heat too, as infrared waves. That's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night. The hotter the object, the more heat it will radiate. The temperature only affects matter. Since space is mostly a vacuum, it doesn't have enough particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation. When the heat from the sun gets to an object, the atoms start absorbing energy, but the heat can't transfer since there is no matter in space. Those rare atoms and molecules in space will absorb the heat. And they'll simply stay that way, while the cold vacuum will stay cold. There's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere, so the energy of the sun can transfer easily. But if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight, it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules. The temperature of the vacuum is negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That means, depending on where you are, space can either burn or freeze you. The sun isn't actually yellow. It emits light over a wide range of wavelengths. 
we can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its spectrum. For instance, cooler stars will appear red, and hotter stars will be blue with yellow, orange, and white stars in between. When it comes to the sun, the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd usually call green, but our eye perceives it differently. So, the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye. We generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one. During sunrise and sunset, there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun, which gives us amazing sceneries. Sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself. They overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field. These parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface. That way, the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots. That contrast makes them appear almost black. If we could take a sunspot apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky, it would be different, as bright as the moon when we see it from the Earth. All the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud, except for Uranus and Venus. They have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction. But it's different with galaxies. They don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles. Also, they're not randomly distributed across space. They come in filaments, dense, slender strands of dark matter and galaxies, with voids in between. Proto-galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space. This is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe. The matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area. So, there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin, but it's mostly random. There's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day. Yep, a cable anchored to the surface of the moon. It would stretch 250,000 miles. We wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both Earth and the Moon are moving. But we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit. Some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars. The Moon has resources we could definitely use. A rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet. Also, we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics. So, after around 53 trips up and down, the elevator could pay for itself. The cable would be as thick as a pencil, but its weight would be around 40 tons. It could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something. There could even be a combination of two elevators. A spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon. There would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of the moon. Planets in our solar system have predictable and stable orbits. But gas giant collisions could have happened at an early stage when a planetary system was still forming. In case of a head-on collision, two gas giants would merge they wouldn't end up losing their mass, the materials in their gaseous envelopes, or the ones in their solid cores. Such a collision at a higher speed would cause the loss of the major part of the envelope gas, and very high speeds, boom, both planets are gone. It's different if it's not a head-on collision. If two cores manage to completely avoid each other, gas giants won't merge, but they'll lose some of the mass gas giants might even change their shape due to such collisions. Astronomers found out there's a galaxy extremely far away from us that looks similar to our Milky Way. We now see it as it was when the universe was only 1.4 billion years old, and now it's 13.8 billion years old. It took over 12 billion years for the light to come from this faraway galaxy and reach our planet. This galaxy is peaceful, stable, and surprisingly non-chaotic, unlike all other galaxies that were quite turbulent in their early stages. To leave the Milky Way, we'd have to travel around 25,000 light-years away from the center of the galaxy, or 500 light-years vertically. 
Our galaxy is a disk of stars that spreads around 100,000 light years across and is 1,000 light years thick. The Sun, its central star, is located halfway from the center of the galaxy and close to the middle of the disk in the vertical direction. We'd have to go further than its edge to get away from the halo that surrounds the Milky Way, old stars, diffuse gas, and globular clusters. If you wanted to go even further to see the Milky Way in all its glory, you'd have to travel 48,000 light years vertically. At this moment, we don't even have a telescope we can send there. There are central stars that eat planets. Our solar system is stable, unlike many other planetary systems. So we don't have to be afraid the Earth or some other planet will change its orbit and go towards the Sun. But at least a quarter of other planetary systems with orbiting stars similar to the Sun have a pretty chaotic past. In some of them, there are planets that used to move around, and their unpredictable migrations have disrupted the paths of some other planets or even pushed them outside of their orbit. That means some planets probably have fallen into the central star. When that happens, the planet gets dissolved in the outer layer of the star, which means it gets eaten. So, you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than our Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and gravity doesn't change as quickly. So the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. The next myth claims we can save the Earth from a giant asteroid with a big bam. The familiar plot is that a spaceship lands on the surface of an asteroid. A team of astronauts quickly drills a hole in it, leaves a present there, and flies away. Then, BAM! As a result, the asteroid may break into several pieces and continue on its way to Earth. Well, big chunks of the asteroid fall to our surface, causing a lot of damage. So our mission is failed. Well, to save Earth, we need a really big BAM. Not only outside the asteroid, but right above its surface. When the boom happens, the force of the blast pushes the asteroid slightly downward. Even a slight change in trajectory would be enough to make the asteroid fly past the Earth in the future. Done! Oh, and if you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yeah, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battle in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you. The sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the third, fourth, and so on until the wave reaches your ear. So to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine, but space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. One more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa! We're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid cloud. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon, so there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the size of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. Another myth is that there's zero gravity in our orbit. Imagine you're in a huge box 10 miles up in the air. Now we let go of the box and it starts to fall. You're falling simultaneously with the box at the same speed. 
And now, it's as if you feel zero gravity. Well, the same thing happens in orbit. The International Space Station is 250 miles above the Earth, and it's falling continuously, though not on the surface of the planet, but around it in its orbit. Its speed at this point is about 4.7 miles per second. It could cross the United States from the West Coast to the East Coast in just 8 minutes. So the astronauts there are experiencing the same thing. They're just falling with the ISS at that speed. Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So, whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there, too. So, it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. The astronauts didn't grab them when they left the moon. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even ripped out the armrests of the seats of the lunar module to reduce its weight. Now, the total weight of human trash on the moon is about 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, rocket stages, and lunar probes. That's like three Boeing 737s. The next myth is about summer. The hot season comes because the Earth approaches the closest distance to the sun in a year. The sun warms our planet more, and we all have to go to the beach. Well, not true. Let's draw an axis through our planet. It's slightly tilted on one side, and winter comes when our planet's axis is tilted away from the sun. But over time, the axis tilts toward the hot star. Then its rays shine at such an angle that it gets warmer. It's true, though, that the Earth happens to be at a different distances from the Sun. This is because our orbit is not a perfect circle, but slightly flattened, an ellipse. Normally, we think of the distance to our star as about 93 million miles. But that distance may be longer or shorter than 3 million miles, depending on which point in our orbit we pass. Another myth about the Sun is that it's yellow. Well, let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white. The Sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our Sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The Sun is about in the middle of the spectrum. You've also heard about how, if you take your spacesuit off in outer space, you'll blow up like a balloon? Well, our bodies are designed to function at atmospheric pressure, like outside. But space is a vacuum. Imagine a huge metal barrel, and we sucked all the air out from there. Add to that a temperature of minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit, and you have space. If you could get into those conditions, all the air pockets in our body, like our lungs, would start to expand. So you really could blow up like a balloon if it weren't for our elastic tissues. They stretch and bend, so you keep your body size. You'll have enough oxygen in your body to last about 20 seconds. Then your brain will begin to starve, and soon you'll pass out. So you won't blow up, and you won't even freeze, because you'll be in a vacuum. It doesn't conduct heat. For example, water conducts heat very well, and you feel cold from it instantly. But you feel better in the air of the same temperature. If you're in the vacuum of space, the super low temperature won't be a problem for you. Much worse is solar radiation. On Earth, we have a shield against radiation in the form of the atmosphere. It blocks the harmful rays. 
in outer space, you would be defenseless. Another myth is related to cell phones. People think that when you dial your friend's number, your phone sends a signal into space. There are a bunch of satellites out there that will pick up your signal and reflect it like a mirror right into your friend's home. No, not true. However, there are satellite phones in the world that work that way. But when you make a cell phone call, your signal is transmitted through a system of cell towers from one to another until it gets to your friend's phone. It's September 1977. You're playing one of the first video game consoles released in North America. You step outside and see the whole neighborhood waiting for Voyager 1 to launch. It's a super sunny day, so you squint a little, trying to see what's happening. You live in the neighborhood right outside the launching station. You get yourself some food and watch the Voyager take off into space. You're so impressed, you decide to dedicate your career to working with NASA. 35 years later, you're now a senior official in NASA, specializing in Voyager 1. It's 2012, and you're sitting in the control room with your colleagues. Everyone is staring at their computer screens as they work on the Voyager. You're sitting on the top, overlooking everything and making sure all systems are in check. This day is special, as Voyager 1 is about to exit the heliosphere, which is a science word for the outer shell of our solar system. It's a bubble of space affected by the solar wind, which comes from the sun. By 2021, it got 14 billion miles away from Earth, which is equivalent to 153 astronomical units from the sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the Earth. The craft was originally meant to fly by Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and toss itself from one planet to another with the use of their gravitational pull. Everyone is impatiently waiting for it to exit the heliosphere. Three, two, one, and it's officially out. All systems are normal and functioning. You praise your team for doing an excellent job. With Voyager 1 reaching this far, there's still tons to explore in outer space. You were once a young adult, watching the craft launch outside your neighborhood. And now, you're the main person in charge of the operation. Nine years later. Since Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, you've been checking up on it every now and then, making sure all systems and functions are in order. It's been sending back measurements of the interstellar medium. It's the area between the stars of our galaxy, consisting of ionized materials. Ionized is basically a simple version of a molecule or substance. The interstellar medium is an electrically charged state of plasma, or ionized plasma, and is very unstable. It's like going from lightning in a thunderstorm back to calm rain in a matter of seconds. The plasma up there is different than the plasma on Earth, in that it's difficult to filter out. There are around 0.06 atoms for every cubic inch in the interstellar medium. The air we breathe on Earth has billions of atoms. By measuring the plasma in the interstellar medium, we can further understand the behavior and structure of chemicals and gases. It's possible that the oxygen we know and love on Earth is different than the ones out there. One of your main tasks is to learn more about how the solar wind from the sun and interstellar medium interact with each other to create the heliosphere. So, after doing some routine checkups and other maintenance work on Voyager 1 from the control room, you notice something strange coming from the screen. You sit in front of the computer, crunching the numbers of the plasma vibrations and convert them into an audio file of about 3 kilohertz. You click on it and listen to an eerie, subtle hum. You and your team are surprised that these vibrations occurred in such a small frequency. Given that space is massive, something like this might mean life on other planets. Everyone else at the station rushes to the control room to listen to that sound from outer space. It's monotonous and faint, but it's definitely coming from outside the heliosphere. You run the numbers over and over to make sure it's not a fluke, but it's on point. You make sure your team doesn't spill the beans to anyone outside until everything is known and clear. You get into beast mode with work and try to catch the sound again, and it remains. You can't sleep trying to think of something that could be producing this hum. A few days pass by, 
and the sound is pretty consistent. If there was some life out there trying to communicate with you, then surely it would have said something that can be deciphered. You analyze the audio files once again, trying to see if it's some phonetic language you don't know. You call in a linguist to see if she can make something out of it. You and the squad gather around, waiting impatiently for some answers. After a while, she believes that it might be someone out there communicating with us, but the only way to find out is by sending something back to them. You arrange a meeting with your team and try to figure out what message you can send. After much thinking and lots of coffee, you decide to send them one phrase in English. Who are you? You send out the signal through Voyager 1 and wait for any changes in the hum, but you don't get anything straight away. It may take some time for a response. You wait all night and still there's nothing. It's starting to look like there isn't anything out there. For the next couple of days, you keep sending out phrases for anything to pick up. Since space is a vacuum, sound waves can't travel. So sending out voice messages on a large speaker won't work. You locate the source of the humming and aim for it when sending the audio file. Every day, you send something different, but still, you don't hear anything from them for a week. It seems that intelligent life in the distant world isn't real. The areas between the star systems and a galaxy aren't necessarily a complete vacuum. That's where the interstellar medium is. It contains gases, dust, and cosmic rays, which are energy particles. After many months of this constant humming being produced, you still try to figure out what's going on. You sit there, remembering the time when the Voyager was first launched. You remember running outside after playing some video games. You couldn't see properly because of the sun, and you freeze in your spot and have a eureka moment. You go through some notes taken in the past. The answer was in front of you all this time. Every now and then, the sun sends a burst of energy that causes the plasma of interstellar space to vibrate. Scientists can measure the frequency of waves when the plasma vibrates to show how close they are to each other. And on the day when the hum was delivered, there were some irregular frequencies coming from the sun. So that hum might have been the plasma vibrating in a weird way because of the sun flares. But these low-level vibrations last longer than quick jumps and spikes. They're fainter. You run the tests again and find out that it's not some intelligent life forms out there trying to talk to you. It's the little vibrations caused by sun flares. You notify your team about this breakthrough and everyone's celebrating. But after all these tests and research, you still don't know why plasma mm. in the interstellar medium vibrates in such a way. Those answers will have to wait. 2027. It's been 50 years since the launch of Voyager 1. You're way into your senior years and just retired from NASA. You have many scholarships in your name and programs for young people who want to learn about space and science. You go back to the control room once more, where you thought you had discovered intelligent life on a distant world. Then you remember all the good times you had. You say goodbye to everything, knowing that this is Voyager's final moments. It was built to last up to 50 years. After that, it'll just be a floating object in the vastness of space. It's already surprising to know that this is Earth's most distant object from us, but it's time to let others take your place. You shut off the lights and close the door. The Voyager makes one last beep before eternal silence. So how's this for opulent? A single parking space in Hong Kong has sold for an astounding 1.3 million bucks. What? The sale has broken the world record for the most expensive parking space. The spot is part of a luxury residential development called The Peak and is where some of the most expensive homes in Asia are located. One of the houses was rented out in May for a cool $210,000 per month. Doing the math, that's $2.5 million per year to rent. The person doesn't even own the home. The History Supreme breaks both the records for the most expensive and the world's biggest superyacht. It's solid gold and 100 feet long. The yacht features a statue made of T-Rex bones, a meteorite rock wall in the master suite, 
a 24 karat gold panoramic wall aquarium. Ooh, are there goldfish? And there's also a rare 18 and a half karat diamond on board. It cost a total of $4.8 billion to make. A racehorse named Fusayichi Pegasus once sold for $60 million. That's around $90 million in today's money. The stallion was in high demand after winning the Kentucky Derby in 2000. In 2012, a Lego brick made of 14 karat gold sold for 12,500 bucks, but it was never intended to be sold. The company gave the bricks out as a gift to their long-term employees. The Koinur diamond is the most valuable in the world and is quite literally priceless. The 109 karat diamond weighs just under one ounce and is the main diamond of the British crown jewels. A single taco in Los Cabos, Mexico could set you back $25,000. Made by a Michelin star chef, its ingredients include beluga caviar, Kobe beef, and a tortilla made with 24 karat gold foil. And you actually eat it? Oh no! At $150,000 a night, the Lover's Deep Luxury Submarine Hotel is the world's most expensive hotel. It's located underwater at the coral reef off the coast of St. Lucia and requires you to take a submarine to get to it. For the price, you get your own captain, private chef and butler, as well as other valuable add-ons. Mermaids are extra. On November 2016, Ripley's Believe It or Not set a new Guinness World Record for the most expensive dress sold at auction. It was the dress worn by Marilyn Monroe when she sang happy birthday to President John F. Kennedy for his 45th birthday. The Jean-Louis dress is said to have over 2,500 crystals and 6,000 hand-sewn rhinestones and was bought for over $500,000. Looking for a flashy car to show off to your friends? Try the Ferrari 250 GTO. It was sold in a private sale from German racing driver Christian Glazel for $70 million. It has an impressive motorsport history, winning the 1964 Tour de France, among other things. It's also never been crashed, which experts say is part of the reason for its high value. A woman once flew from Italy to the UK to pay $16,400 for a haircut. Oh my god! For the price, she got a limo ride to the airport, a head massage, and personalized hair products. Oh, and a lunch. Mm. Back in 2019, a Japanese sushi master paid a record $3.1 million for a bluefin tuna. The 612-pound fish was sold at Tokyo's fish market. Ooh, that's some sushi! Developed by Chinese agricultural scientist, the Shenzhen Nanke orchid made headlines in 2005. It took eight years to create, and the flower only blooms every four or five years. It became the most expensive flower ever sold when someone picked it up for $290,000. Celebrated musician Peter Scheidloff owned one of only 10 Stradivarius violas intact today. It was put up for auction in 2014 with a minimum asking price of $45 million. There was no confirmed buyer, so you can still get your hands on the world's most expensive instrument. Oh my God. The costliest teddy bear is a stiff Louis Vuitton bear. In 2000, one sold for a whopping $182,000. A painting by Leonardo da Vinci made headlines when it raked in over $450 million at auction. After a 19-minute long bidding battle, the painting, called Salvatore Monday, was sold to the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. But experts are debating whether da Vinci even painted the portrait, with many believing that it's actually a copy of a lost work. The most expensive home ever built belongs to business tycoon Mukesh Ambani. Hmm. Known as the richest man in India, he built the 400,000-square-foot home in Mumbai in 2012. It has 27 floors and is worth $22.3 billion. It has a spa, a 168-car garage, a 50-person theater, three helipads, a ballroom, two-story recreation center, and, of course, a garden terrace. One Easter egg cost a whopping $8.4 million. It has a diamond-encrusted shell containing over 1,000 diamonds. Inside sits an 18-karat gold globe, which contains a crystal dove perched on a gold olive branch. The most valuable board game is an exclusive Monopoly set. The board is covered with 23-karat gold, rubies, and sapphires. The dice alone contain 42 diamonds for all the spots. It'll cost you $200,000. In Salerno, Italy, the price tag of a pizza can reach $12,000. 
The Louis XIII pizza takes a grand total of 72 hours to make. When you order, a pizza chef, sommelier, and exclusive limited-edition cutlery and plates all turn up at your home. Black Ivory coffee routinely hits the $1,500 per pound mark, but the manufacturing process might put you off. The beans go through the digestive tract of elephants. The elephant's stomach acids break down coffee proteins, which creates a unique smooth flavor. Looking for a mug to enjoy your coffee in? The world's flashiest coffee mug was made for Nestle and is made of 23 karat gold. It will set you back $33,000. America's interstate highway system is the most expensive transport megaproject ever. It took 46 years to complete and cost around $500 billion to make. But it did pay off, literally. The system has returned more than six times in economic productivity for each dollar it cost. In 2019, a Patek Philippe watch broke records selling at an auction for a staggering $31 million. It's a one-of-a-kind watch, you think? and was made specifically for a charity auction, which helped boost the bidding prices. Just as the name suggests, the billionaire couture umbrella is the world's most expensive umbrella. What? It's made of waterproof alligator skin and costs a mega $50,000. $3.5 million is the price tag attached to the world's most famous wedding dress. Complete with a cascading cape and a sweetheart neckline, the dress was designed by Sarah Burton for one of the most famous tennis players of our time. The Ubari King Melon fetches prices as high as $14,000, and that's just for one. They can only be found in a single region of the world and have a unique sweetness, accounting for the price tag. Hawaii is the most expensive American state to live in, the main factor being that it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Basically, any physical goods cost more as they have to be shipped across from the mainland. The most expensive trading card in the world is the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle card. Mantle was center fielder and first baseman of the New York Yankees from 1951 to 1968. He was named Most Valuable Player of the American League three times. There are only three of his trading cards believed to be in circulation. Rob Goh bought one of the cards for an astonishing $5.2 million in November 2020. Coming in at the number one spot for the most expensive dog in the world is the Samoy. Originating from Serbia, they are known for their affectionate nature. They cost between $600 and $3,000. A hedge fund manager bought the most expensive home ever recorded in U.S. history. Located next to Central Park in New York's Manhattan, the man purchased the top four floors of the building for $238 million. It was bought unfurnished, so that doesn't even include the cost of decor, furniture, or fixtures. The same man also holds the records for the most expensive home purchases in New York, Florida, and Illinois. The world's most expensive motorbike is the Neiman Marcus Limited Edition Fighter. It went to auction with a starting price of $110,000. But because Neiman Marcus is a chain of luxury department stores, it received so much press and attention that it was sold for $11 million. The priciest plot of land is located in China, at 2 Murray Road in Hong Kong Central Business District. The plot was sold in May 2017 for a mere $3 billion. It measures 31,000 square feet, which prices each square foot at around $97,000. Zaha Hadid architects are said to be designing a 36-story skyscraper to take its place. Hoo-wee, that's some pricey property! Now, as much as we love epic space battles with blasters cutting through the black void and causing cheerful booms, that's not exactly what happens when something explodes in the big black. Space is basically vacuum, meaning it has no oxygen. And oxygen is an essential part of any process of burning we have here on Earth. You might argue that stars can burn and explode into supernova, but that's not exactly true either. Stars don't rely on oxygen, so they're not burning. There are constant thermonuclear reactions going on inside them. So a spaceship can only explode like that if it has a nuclear power plant installed in it. If it doesn't, then the only special effect you get is a brief flash that disappears in the blink of an eye. Liquid oxygen, which is often on board spaceships, is very quick to burn out in the vacuum of outer space. As for the boom, oxygen plays a crucial role here too. 
Sound only travels thanks to molecules of air bumping into each other. Since there's no air in space, the whole scene would be pretty much absolutely silent. And that's not a bad thing either. Just imagine how deafening would the sun be if the sound could travel in space. Despite what many sci-fi directors want us to believe, there's no dark side to the moon. Our satellite is tidally locked with Earth, meaning it's always turned to us with one side, while the other always looks away. The sun is much farther from us than the moon, and we're both turning round and round, warming and lighting this side and that in turn. It means that once in every short while, the moon is lit by the sun from either side. It's just that we can't see it from where we are. While things appear weightless in outer space, there's actual gravity all over the place. It becomes weaker the further you get from a heavy object, like our planet, but it's still there. In fact, there's not a single place in the universe that isn't affected by gravity of this or that cosmic object. Everything that has mass has gravity as well. Yes, even you and me. But space objects are so massive that they tug smaller things towards them. That's why the planets of the solar system orbit around the Sun, and our whole Milky Way galaxy orbits around its own center. Scientists believe there's a supermassive black hole there, about 4 million times heavier than the Sun, which keeps all the stars and systems from flying apart. Our movie hero leaves the orbit of Mars on their trusty spaceship and heads on towards Jupiter. Their face is grim and determined, even though they know what threat awaits them ahead – the asteroid belt. They pitch and yaw, dodging the asteroid flying at enormous speeds toward the spacecraft, but one of them still hits it. No, just a scratch, thankfully. Finally, our hero leaves the danger zone and wipes the sweat from the brow with a shaking hand. Sounds familiar, but couldn't be further from the truth. Asteroids in the belt between Mars and Jupiter are so few and far between that if you ever travel through it, you might not even encounter one the whole way. There are about 1.5 million sizable space rocks flying there, give or take a half million. But let's not forget space is a vast place. The distance between two asteroids of any significant size would be millions of miles. So a space chase with two ships weaving between floating rocks would be quite boring in there. Space is often depicted as a black, cold, and desolate place, especially when a movie astronaut leaves the safety of their spaceship. Everything about this description is okay, except for the cold part. It's only true if you find yourself in some really far corner of our galaxy that has no nearby stars. But if you're, for example, in the Earth's orbit and directly facing the Sun, the temperature in the cosmic vacuum could reach a scorching 250 degrees. That's why spacesuits are white. This color reflects light better than any other. Still, the temperature at your back, which isn't exposed to the Sun's rays, can be really freezing indeed. Heat doesn't spread equally through space, so if you're not turned towards a heat source, you get very, very cold. Speaking about the sun, it somehow always appears yellow in movies. The fact is, the color we see from Earth is an optical illusion created by our planet's atmosphere, just as the blue sky during the day. The light from the sun spreads in the atmosphere and gets distorted, making colorful spectacles at dawn and dusk. In the vacuum of space, there's nothing to reflect the light, so the sun appears as it really is – white. That ball of glowing gas is that hot. There's a bright flash in the sky, followed by a tail of smoke, and a red-hot space rock crashes into the ground, leaving a huge, charred crater after impact. Well, although the smoky tail and the crater are partly true, meteorites don't really have a chance to become that hot while falling. Meteorite is an asteroid that somehow entered the Earth's atmosphere and survived the friction enough to fall on the surface. This happens pretty often, we just don't usually see those rocks because they're normally quite small and fall into uninhabited areas. But even if one falls within a city, the crater would appear because of the sheer speed of the meteorite, not its heat. They do get much hotter because of friction, yet not so much as to burn everything on the ground on impact. As much as we want to believe in instant communication between spaceships and planets, it's not possible, at least not yet. Modern communication systems rely on radio signals that have a pretty slow speed compared to the vast expanses of space. 
it would take years for such a signal to travel even one light year, let alone hundreds and thousands. If you want to send a message to a galaxy far, far away, be prepared to wait a couple of millennia and then a couple more to receive a reply. On that note, space is not as crowded and full of events as is often shown on the silver screen. It's mostly a rather lonely place, where planets, stars, and other objects are separated by billions of miles of nothingness. Even if you have a spaceship that can travel at the speed of light, most of the time you'll only see black void full of stars and planets far away. The distances are enormous out there, even between the closest objects. For a better understanding, the Moon, which you can see so well on a clear night, is about 239,000 miles away, as like traveling around the Earth almost 10 times in a row. Warp drives that can distort space-time and get you to a distant corner of an alien galaxy in the blink of an eye, that's a staple of any space opera. Spaceships capable of such a feat are always shown as instantly accelerating from zero to faster than light. According to the law of physics, people on board should, well, at least be pushed into their seats hard. More strictly speaking, no one would be able to survive such an acceleration because it's too many Gs on a fragile human body. Until we find a way to reduce the effects of overload, we can't even start thinking of space warps. Water isn't the rarest and most precious resource in the universe. In fact, there's a humongous space cloud several million light-years away from us that consists entirely of water. Its reserves would be enough to fill all our oceans 140 trillion times over. And many planets, some even in our solar system, seem to have liquid water on them. The most precious resource in space is life and that requires a lot more stuff to appear than just liquid water. Astronauts are often shown working out on the ISS and sci-fi space stations, and that much is true, they do need physical activity. But the reason isn't that they need strong bodies to work in space. The gravity out there is much weaker, and astronauts don't use their muscles as much as on Earth. So when they come back to the surface, gravity hits them as a sledgehammer, and their bodies feel squishy. To alleviate those effects, they train every day. Although they say we can see millions of stars on a clear starry night, that number is much more modest, about 3,000. All the rest are other objects that are also luminous and mistaken for stars – planets, distant galaxies, and even artificial satellites. They're simply being illuminated by real stars, just like the Moon, and become seen. But because they're that far away, we can't tell if they're stars or not. Still, you got to admit, it's all still pretty cool. We'll start with one of the most recent and shocking discoveries of 2020. Perhaps our solar system has life beyond Earth. This is Venus, the second planet from the Sun and the sister of our home planet. It's called so because it has a similar size and mass, but the conditions on it are simply terrible. The temperature on its surface reaches 890 degrees Fahrenheit because of the greenhouse effect, and the atmospheric pressure on it is as strong as if you were 3,000 feet underwater. But in this hostile world, there can actually be life. For many years, there have been discussions on this subject. In 2007, scientists discovered there once had been an ocean on Venus. That is, in the distant past, there could have been some form of life. But in the fall of 2020, there was an epic argument in which scientists tried to find out whether life on Venus exists right now. In September, the discovery of a new life marker on Venus was announced. The ALMA telescope in the Atacama Desert found phosphine gas above the planet, and the amount of this gas suggested that it may have been produced by certain microorganisms. But already in October, the data was analyzed again, and the new results indicate it was an error. So today, we consider Venus to be uninhabited once more. But who knows, maybe soon we'll get new data, and new disputes will arise in scientific circles. And while some scientists are scratching their heads and still concentrating on Venus, 
Others have looked into distant space and discovered 24 planets on which life can exist. And on all of them, living conditions are much better than on Earth. Such planets are called superhabitable. These super planets must be 1.3 times larger than the Earth and twice as massive. Thus, they will have stronger gravity and, as a consequence, a denser and warmer atmosphere. So, the climate on superhabitable planets must be similar to the tropical climate on Earth. This will ensure the maximum diversity of living organisms. The host star of such a planet must be a red dwarf. They're much smaller than the sun and not so bright, but their lifespan can reach 70 billion years. For comparison, the lifespan of the sun is seven times shorter, and it's already past half of it. Slow and steady wins the race. It will give enough time for potential life to develop and evolve. And here's a suitable planet for the title of superhabitable, Kepler-1649c. In 2020, it was named the most similar planet to Earth. It's only 6% larger than our home world. It orbits a red dwarf, a quarter the size of our sun. The planet is in the habitable zone of the star and makes a complete circle around it in 19.5 days. The climate on Kepler remains a mystery. It's known to receive about 75% of the light we get from the sun. So the temperature on its surface may be close to Earth's, but we still don't know the composition of the atmosphere and other necessary conditions for life to appear there. The next discovery is one of the most amazing spectacles ever seen by humanity. It's the collision of a star with a black hole. In September 2019, scientists began watching how, for six months, a sun-like star was being spaghettified. Light from this event traveled 215 million light years, and we saw a star about 860,000 miles wide slurped up by a black hole. This black disk is so heavy that it has incredibly strong gravity. Nothing can leave its gravitational field. And now we see a star slowly approaching it. First, the glowing light layers of the star begin to stretch towards the black hole. It looks as if the star is simply unrolling like a ball of thread. Then we see this hot plasma lingering at the edges of the black hole. And it may seem these particles are now orbiting it, but it's just an illusion. This ring of light is called the event horizon. The black hole curves not only space, but time as well. This close to it, time slows down. To the observer, it looks as if the light near the edge of the black disk has almost stopped. But in fact, it has long been absorbed by the dark abyss. When a black hole eats a certain amount of star material, it starts spitting it out. Powerful beams of energy are ejected at speeds of over 6,000 miles per second. This is the light that attracted scientists' attention. In the end, the black hole has completely absorbed about half of the star and spit out the other half into space. And even though we watched this process for only a couple of minutes, it was happening for six months. And here is one of the youngest planetary systems that humanity has ever observed. AU Microscopii. It's so young, there's still a disk around it from the debris this system was made of. But this time, we don't even hope to find life here. The host star of this exoplanet continually emits radiation flares that would wipe out any form of life from the planet's surface. The planet that orbits this dangerous star is called AU Mick B, and it's just a newborn baby by astronomical standards. It's so close to its star that it makes a complete circle around it in 8.5 days. The age of this planet is only 12 million years. So at the time AU Mick B was born, mastodons walked on the surface of our planet and meadows and savannas were covering the Earth's face. So you and I can consider ourselves old timers because the age of the Earth is almost 4.5 billion years. The next discovery took place in early 2020, and it's very similar to a landscape from science fiction. It's a planet with two suns. Well, more precisely, it doesn't orbit around a single star, as we are used to in our solar system, but around a binary star system, TOI-1338. 
The first big star is like the sun. The other is a red dwarf, which is three times smaller. These stars completely circle each other in a little over 14 days. The planet that orbits these stars is the size of Saturn, which is much larger than the Earth. Although the sunsets and sunrises there look incredibly beautiful, this planet is unlikely to be suitable for any form of life. It's outside the habitable zone of its host stars, so it probably doesn't have liquid water. Mysterious radio signals from outer space have also been received in 2020. We're talking about fast radio bursts. Scientists recorded such signals before, but recently they have managed to prove that they are repeated after a certain period of time. The new data have forced the scientists to come up with a very bold theory that their source may be a magnetar. A magnetar is a neutron star that is small and has a huge mass compared to ordinary stars like the Sun. But they have the strongest magnetic field in the entire universe. Their lifetime is very short though, only one million years. But what baffled scientists the most this year was discovering that the moon is rusting. Corrosion needs oxygen and water to take place, but the moon doesn't have its own atmosphere to have both. The main theory says the solar wind is to blame. It moves at great speed and scrapes oxygen from the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere. The wind continues to carry oxygen molecules through space, and eventually they reach the surface of the moon and cause metal ore to rust. By the way, the signature red color of Mars was created because of the rust. For a long time, there was an atmosphere and water. In combination with iron on its surface, it triggered a long process of rusting, which has lasted since ancient times. Another stunning discovery was found on the surface of the moon with a stratospheric telescope. It's an aircraft that carries a telescope. The plane raises it to an altitude of eight miles, and this allows it to have a picture quality comparable to that of space telescopes. And with the help of such an unusual observatory, scientists were able to find water on the surface of the moon. Water molecules were found in one of the largest craters on the visible side of the satellite. But the number of water molecules is still extremely small there. The Sahara Desert has about 100 times more water than the surface of the moon. Houston, we've got good news. A group of select humans is being interviewed to hop on board the first commercial vacation to outer space. The space agency has given you a survey to answer. They want to know what you would pack on this space adventure. Depending on your answers, you just might be one of the chosen ones. Now how about we take a look at that list together? Pencils. I guess I never would have thought of that, but it makes sense. Legend has it that the U.S. spent millions of dollars trying to design a pen that worked in space. You know, since the lack of gravity is a huge, I mean, inescapable factor of life in outer space, pens don't work. The ink won't flow down as it does here on Earth. It turns out that pencils will do the trick. This way you can play word puzzles with the other space tourists, or even make some drawings of your adventure. You'd never forget to pack a toothbrush, of course. According to veteran astronauts, toothbrushes are so simple yet their technology is enough for space. If you were to squeeze a water bottle inside a spacecraft, the molecules of water would float around in small bubbles. But if you wet your toothbrush, it naturally holds the water in it, keeping it moist to receive your toothpaste. Oh, I was going to say funny socks. Glad that you beat me to it. Here are two things. First, there's not a lot of walking that goes on in space. People don't tend to touch the ground too much up there. And second, space isn't the best place to showcase your fashion style. Yeah! Astronauts tend to use special clothes while they're out there. And it will be no different for you as a space vacationer. So socks will keep your feet warm and fuzzy, but they'll also speak for your fashion interest. Maybe one day you'll wear a smiley face sock, while the other day you'll go for a Grinch-themed one. Of course, socks are pretty helpful on board an aircraft. They'll make you slide through stuff more easily. Next time I go to the convenience store, I'll remember to buy some wet wipes for your space travel. Experienced space travelers do love them. And it wasn't even NASA that invented them, huh? Since water is a no-go inside a spaceship, the best option is wet wipes. 
better yet if they're scented. Astronauts even use different kinds of wipes. They buy the disinfecting ones and the ones to use on their bodies. Just make sure you know how to tell the difference between them when you're up there. There's a popular myth that says that NASA invented Velcro. But the truth is, we tend to think that everything that's used in space was invented by NASA for a very intelligent and specific purpose. It wasn't though. Velcro was invented for mundane reasons back in the 1950s by a Swiss company. They were adopted by space travelers because they work as anti-gravity props. They don't erase gravity, of course. But you can glue Velcros into daily stuff and then hang them on the Velcro attached to the spaceship's walls. It's a very smart system, but best to take your own pair, right? If you're spending a long time in outer space, photographs from back home might come in handy. Choose them well, though. Since the spacecraft isn't all that big, the rest of the people on board will know which pictures you decided to bring along. Best to keep that Harry Styles poster back in your earthly bedroom, right? Just bring real pictures of people that you know and love. Did I hear pizza? A huge part of traveling and exploring new places is being able to taste different flavors of food. In outer space, that's a bit more complicated. But hey, at least you can take some pizza with you. Well, actually you'd have to have it delivered to you in a cargo ship. This way, ingredients would come fresh and ready to eat. It wouldn't be the first time that people in space tried eating Earthling junk food. Some astronauts have even eaten crepes and hot dogs. Perhaps the best part of this pizza party would be that your food could float. Now isn't this a super nice way to enjoy some Earth delicacies? Hmm, as much as I understand your desire to pack a toilet with you on this space trip, that's virtually impossible. I mean, I understand you. Some people are attached to the toilets in their homes. And a space toilet is far from the ideal experience. But NASA has been improving their toilet system, and it's the best it's been over the years. So that will have to do. Here's something I would take as well. A laptop. But what good would it do in outer space, you might ask? Apparently, there is internet all over the International Space Station. So even if you're not spending most of your trip docked at the ISS, you could enjoy some Netflix on the days you spend over there. There is internet all over the ISS, apparently. Crazy, huh? And speaking of leisure, I love that you would take a yo-yo. I'm not sure how efficient it would be in space, since there's no gravity to bounce it back and forth. But it would be nice to see how a yo-yo reacts in a gravity-free environment. Oh, I love jigsaw puzzles. This would definitely be on my list as well. Imagine trying to build a jigsaw puzzle that keeps floating in the air. Maybe you'll have to create a system to avoid the separate pieces floating aimlessly through the spacecraft. But imagine once you finish that turtle puzzle, it will look like it's swimming around the craft. You can't pack a window, but they sure are an important part of life in outer space. Let's keep in mind some of the rules of the trip. Each traveler will have the opportunity to do one spacewalk during their time in space. This is already huge. Consider yourself lucky. Some elite astronauts only get to do one spacewalk during their entire career. That is so because spacewalks are risky and require a lot of training. But you'll get your training once you're up there. The thing is, all other days you'll be stuck inside a floating tin can. So windows will come a long way. They'll help to remind you where you are. They'll give you some perspective of space and Earth. Of course, you should take your camera. How else will you be able to register for this once-in-a-lifetime experience? Just make sure it works inside an aircraft or the ISS and you're good to go. Hmm? Coffee? Don't worry, you don't need to pack your own. Up until recently, astronauts had to rely solely on instantly brewed cups of coffee when they were in space. But you're lucky that coffee experts have already solved this issue. Nowadays, there's the ISS Presso machine. The machine itself is similar in size to an Earthling espresso machine. But to drink it, space travelers have to use a zero-gravity coffee cup together with a straw. If you try drinking it regularly, you wouldn't get hot coffee to hit you directly in your face. Instead, the coffee would be glued to the bottom of your cup. I have to say I really stand this invention. Last, but not least, why not pack your guitar with you? I noticed you were missing a musical instrument. If this was a conventional flight, you might have to pay extra for luggage. But since it's all included, don't be shy and take your guitar. Astronauts such as Chris Hadfield take their musical instruments with them when they're in space. He even became famous for his version of Bowie's Space Oddity. Up to the point that Bowie himself told him he lived Chris's version of it. It helps to pass the time, but it's also great for socializing. Can you imagine a pretend bonfire happening in the void of space? I can. And it looks super cool. Well, I think you're set to go.
I'll personally call NASA and ask them to pick you as one of the lucky space travelers. See you in outer space, amigo. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? If you've watched the movie Alien, then you know the answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut, though, if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions. Like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first. Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it, it's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. 
The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit, while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now imagine living like that for six months, or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. Now as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? Two pictures are rapidly changing in front of your eyes. Our huge planet and a black void. The picture of Earth is getting smaller by the second. You're flying away from the spaceship into an endless vacuum and don't know what to do next. The International Space Station flies 250 miles above Earth's surface. A spacewalk is routine for astronauts who work there. Astronauts have spent more than 11,000 hours in the black abyss to this day. Fortunately, during all this time, no one has ever flown away into outer space without coming back, as we've seen in the movies. But unfortunately, astronauts face other, no less terrible, dangers during spacewalks. One such accident happened in 1966. Eugene Cernan put on a jetpack and went into outer space to carry out some repair work. The jetpack which helps an astronaut control flight in zero gravity, heated up a lot. Eugene put on special protective pants made of metal to protect himself from this heat. The pants protection didn't work when he went into outer space. Instead of directing the heat away from his body, the pants began to heat up. The suit was heavy and uncomfortable, like a knight's armor. 
it rubbed his skin and restricted movement. Working in zero gravity is physically very hard, but Eugene also had to deal with his whole suit heating up that day. Inside the spacesuit, he felt like he was in a hot bath. High temperatures and hard work caused overexertion, dehydration, and severe weight loss. His face was sweating, and drops of sweat blinded him. During this spacewalk, the astronaut lost about 13 pounds of weight. Other astronauts came to the rescue and took him back to his spacecraft. To reduce overheating, they sprayed him with cold water from a hose. In a sense, to go out into an infinitely huge open space, an astronaut must put on a suit resembling a body cage. Another dangerous incident happened in 1973. Two astronauts, Pete Conrad and Joe Kerwin, went into outer space to repair a solar wing on the Skylab space station. The wing didn't turn around, and the astronauts tried moving it manually. Using force, they turned the stuck wing, but it pushed them. The push was so strong that it threw both astronauts aside. They didn't have time to grab onto a nearby surface and began to fly away into outer space. Fortunately, they had safety cables that didn't let the astronauts go away for good. By grasping them, the astronauts returned to safety. In an ordinary modern spacesuit, there are more than 10 protective layers. Such a suit protects against extreme cold and hot temperatures. It's tear resistant and doesn't leak moisture from the outside. This protection is necessary to prevent depressurization. If a small passage appears between your body and space, then all the oxygen will start coming out of the spacesuit. The more oxygen the suit loses, the more vacuum it gets. This leads to terrible consequences, such as suffocation and increased body volume. It looks as if you start to inflate from the inside. In 2007, Rick Mastraccio went into outer space to do some repair work. For some reason, there was a hole in his left glove next to his thumb. It was on the outer layer of the glove. But the worst thing was that the astronaut hadn't noticed it. He continued to work as if nothing had happened. But one damaged layer could destroy the second. The second one could tear the third one, and so on, until the vacuum reached the astronaut's skin. Rick was supposed to work six hours in outer space, but during the fourth hour, he noticed the damage in his spacesuit. The astronaut reported this to command and received an urgent order to return to the ship. He never found out how the hole had appeared. Inside the ISS, there are many chemicals necessary for working in space. For example, ammonia has the property of freezing almost any surface. This chemical frost is used to cool some components of the station during overheating. The leakage of this substance on the ISS is practically impossible. This is exactly what astronaut Robert Kerbeam heard from experts during the training before his first flight to space. But this accident occurred to him on his first spacewalk in 2001. Robert was working outside the space station when an ammonia leak started. The liquid splattered all over his spacesuit. A thick layer of ice quickly covered the glass. Robert didn't see anything. He feared that he had broken something, but the accident was not his fault. The protective layers of the spacesuit didn't allow Robert to freeze, but the ammonia severely restricted his movements. The main problem was that he couldn't return to the ship. Ammonia could get into the station, and this could lead to an emergency. Robert had to stand in outer space for one and a half hours and wait for the leak to end. After that, he successfully returned to the station. To realize how difficult work is in outer space, we need to understand what a spacesuit is. It weighs 280 pounds, which is as much as a scooter. You won't feel its weight in zero gravity, but it will still make you sweat. Astronaut Chris Hadfield had described it by saying that every movement inside your spacesuit meets resistance. The suit scratches your skin, squeezes your bones and joints, and forces you to spend twice as much energy on simple movements. In such conditions, you start sweating and your eyes get wet. This moisture flies inside the helmet and blinds you until it evaporates. 
But if there's too much moisture, it can threaten the life of an astronaut. Such a case happened in 2013 with astronaut Luca Parmitano. He went into space to measure something outside the station. At one point, he felt that the back of his head was wet. He informed the others about it and got an order to return to the station. When Luca was coming back, he had to turn upside down. As soon as he did this, water gushed into his helmet. It covered most of his face. Luca couldn't see or hear. He tried to report the trouble to base, but the water covered his mouth. Fortunately, his partners rescued him and helped him return to the station. When they opened the helmet, almost half a gallon of water poured out. Astronauts' cables are some of the most reliable defenses against floating away into space. But what if one broke from a strong push or because the astronaut didn't fix it well? For additional protection, there's a backpack called SAFER, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. It's like a jetpack. It releases gas from small tubes and changes the direction of your flight. If you're spinning in space, SAFER stops and aligns your movements. You can take manual control and fly using a special joystick. SAFER was first used in 1994, but before engineers created it, there was the MMU, the Manned Maneuvering Unit. In 1984, astronaut Bruce McCandless used it for the first time. You may have seen this famous photo where he floats in outer space without a cable. The problem was that Bruce was the first tester of such a jetpack. He wasn't 100% sure if it would work. He went into outer space and unhooked the cable from himself. There was nothing else to keep him from flying into the infinite black abyss, and his team wouldn't be able to save him. Imagine how scary it must have been. Fortunately, the jetpack worked. However, after three missions, NASA decided to stop using the MMU as it was unsafe. After that, engineers invented SAFER. Jetpacks and cables are reliable safety systems, but the best protection for an astronaut in space is their skills. Each astronaut has six years of higher education and several more years of training. They spend many hours training in virtual reality with spacewalk simulations. They train their body, endurance, and mind, since the main thing in a dangerous situation in space is not to panic and stay calm. No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them, and some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. 
Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the moon flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the moon, the side that we never see because the moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously, and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. (laughs) So these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. 
In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends.